We've talked about really the process of what makes a waste a hazardous waste. We've talked a little bit about performing a waste determination. Let's try to take that information and, and roll it out in an example so that we can illustrate just how this all gets put together. So for the example I have, it's a machining operation, a fairly typical process for New Hampshire manufacturing, a CNC metal machining process where the computer controls the cutting action of, of the machine. So if I can get you to read along with me. A milling machine is used at a mechanical metalworking shop to cut stainless steel. Water soluble coolant is used to protect the cutting bit, the part that's doing the, the cutting, and the blank, which is the piece being cut. Previous analyses have shown that the coolant product before use is non-hazardous. But after repeated use, it loses its structural integrity and it can't be used anymore. So what we want to do is find out if this used coolant is actually hazardous, and if so, why? So here you can see in the picture is one of these computer numerically controlled CNC milling machines just cutting away at a part. So we've got five steps and to start with we'll look at is this a waste? So it's a coolant that has been used until it can no longer be used because it doesn't work anymore. So in this example, yes, we have a waste. It would also be considered for the reason spent. Secondly, is this something that's specifically exempted? Well, the only thing that you could do here is go to chapter 400 of the regulations and flip through those five or six pages of exemptions to see if there are any that describe spent coolant or used coolant. In our scenario, you're not going to find any exemption for that. But our third question, is this a listed hazardous waste? So let's start thinking a little bit more deeply about what this process and what the materials are. So what do we have? For our materials, we started out with a non-hazardous coolant. This is a water-soluble coolant, gets blended with water, and in the end is about 90 to 95% water. Our process in the cutting actually includes stainless steel as well, so our final waste could be a blend of coolant, water, and anything in the stainless steel. So for starters, let's look at is this a listed hazardous waste. Alright, so let's look at our four different lists. Two of them describe wastes that are unused. Two of them describe wastes that are used. This is a used coolant, so we've eliminated the P list and the U list. Those are for things that have never been through a process. But we still need to worry about the K list and the F list. Let's start with the F list. If you remember, the F list can be broken out also into six different groups. So the first is spent solvents. Here we have a used coolant. Is that the same as a used solvent? Well, no. A solvent is actually designed to chemically dissolve materials so that it can be carried away. Our coolant is there to lower the temperature to protect the metal that's being worked with. Our second group is electroplating or chemical metalworking wastes. We have metal, and we're doing work with metal, but it's not chemical metalworking. Chemical metalworking would be such as acids being used to etch material away, or plating operation that's adding material to a component. Our third group is chemical manufacturing. Obviously, we're doing a metal machining operation, we're not making chemicals. Likewise, we're not doing wood treatment processes, we're not doing petroleum refining, and we're not dealing with leachate from some disposed listed waste. 
So in the end, we do not have an F-listed waste. In our K list, we have to look at 13 different industrial categories, 13 types of businesses. And if you remember, in New Hampshire, the two that I'm most concerned about are iron and steel industry and ink formulation. Well, clearly we're not making ink here, but what about the iron and steel industry? Would this process fit into what's intended there? Once again, no, because the iron and steel K listings apply to foundry operations where metal is being made from the ore or from scrap, melted and poured into a form. That's not what we're doing here. We're doing a metal machining operation. All right, so after review, we find that we don't have a listed waste. We don't have a PRU listed waste because it's not unused. The stuff has been through a process. We looked at the F list and we determined that it didn't fit into any of those six categories. We found that it's not a K list because it's not one of the 13 industrial classifications. But what we need to look at now is those four characteristics, ICRT, ignitable, corrosive, reactive, and toxic, and see if any of those apply to our waste stream. Starting with ignitability. Remember, things that catch fire really easily. Does it have a low flash point? So let's think about our waste stream for a minute. We said that our coolant is a blend of water at 90 to 95% water, the coolant, which was non-hazardous to start with, and stainless steel. If you mix those two, three together, do you think we would have something that caught fire very easily? Now certainly for the purpose of this scenario, for this training video, it's very easy to say, well, 90 to 95 percent water, it's not going to catch fire hardly at all. And that's probably true. But remember that you're the generator, you're the one that takes responsibility for doing a proper determination. So if you're unsure, you could do some more research, you could have a test performed. Whatever it takes to find that balance between budget and confidence for you. So, for our scenario, not ignitable. Our second characteristic is corrosivity. Things with a very high pH or a very low pH. Very acid or very caustic. Once again, think about what is in our waste. Some non-hazardous coolant. 90 to 95% water and stainless steel. What are the chances that that blend would create something with a pH less than or equal to 2 or greater than or equal to 12 and a half? Not very likely. And think beyond that. If we're a machining operation and we're trying to cut metal to a very fine tolerance, would we use a coolant that could be very acid or very basic? It would etch away at our metal damaging our product. So no, once again for our scenario, not corrosive. If you're not sure as the generator, how tough would it be to get some pH paper and dip it in, see what the pH is. Our third characteristic is reactivity. Reactivity again, things that are inherently explosive. Do you see this used coolant as being explosive? hope not. Is it something that would react very badly with water? Well, no, it's 90-95% water. How about reacting badly with air? Once again, it's surrounded by air. If it was reactive with air, we'd have a real problem. So is this something that's inherently explosive, inherently reactive? Once again, not in our scenario. But that brings us to the characteristic of toxicity, the last of our four. Remember, there are 39 different metals and chemicals in our regulations that we're concerned about if they're above a particular concentration. So when we look at the materials that's in our waste, non-hazardous coolant, water, and stainless steel, we want to think about whether any of those things contain toxicity characteristic constituents. 
Anytime you work with a metal, whether in industry or in your life, you're really dealing with an alloy, a blend of different metals. So for instance, stainless steel has different constituents, different ingredients that give it different properties. Iron is in there, nickel, chromium, and then a bunch of other things may or may not be. You might have molybdenum, you might have boron, you might have uh, silicon, I've even seen cadmium and lead in stainless steel. So as we look at these ingredients that are in the alloy of stainless, think about are they on the table for the toxicity characteristic? Go back to the regulations, read through the table, and what you will find is, yes, chromium, cadmium, and lead all show up on the table for toxicity characteristics. So we do need to be concerned about these. So in my scenario, what I have done is I've taken a representative sample of my coolant, I've sent it out to a laboratory and asked them to run an analysis on it. Find out what the concentration is for those characteristics and any other metals that may show up in my used coolant. And these are the results that I got back. So looking at the top section, we see that there's a column indicating the contaminant. What is the metal that we're concerned with? We have a result for the concentration, what, what was in our coolant. And then in the right-hand column, something known as the minimum detectable limit. And we'll get to each of those in a second. The first row, we look at arsenic. Arsenic is found to have a concentration of two parts per million. We'd compare that to our regulations in our rules and see what the regulated concentration is for arsenic. What we find is that it's only hazardous if it's above five parts per million. Our result is two, well below five, so our waste is not hazardous because of its arsenic concentration. So we look next at barium. Barium is regulated at 100 parts per million. Our lab result says BDL. What does that mean? Well, BDL stands for below detectable limit. That means that the laboratory could not see any barium. Well, that's great news, but how good is the lab's equipment? How low can they see? Maybe they can't see any barium if it's less than a thousand. That wouldn't do us any good. We're worried about a hundred. Well, fortunately, that third column, the minimum detectable level, tells us essentially how good the equipment is, how low they can find barium. And according to our laboratory, they can see barium if it's at two parts per million or more. They didn't see any, so we know that the end result is less than two. Barium, again, is regulated at 100, so we're safe. Our third constituent, cadmium, is also below the detectable limit. Here, the laboratory says they can see as low as 0.2 parts per million. The regulatory standard for cadmium is 1, so we know we're well below what's regulated. Once again, we are not hazardous because of the cadmium content. Next, chromium, 98 parts per million. Well, the regulated level for chromium is five parts per million. So in this instance, we actually do have a problem. We found that our chromium is so high, this is going to be a regulated hazardous waste. We'll take the waste code for chromium, D007, and put it on any labels for the container or tank holding this coolant, as well as put it on the shipping papers used to send it off-site. Are we done? Found out it was hazardous. Well, no, we have to keep going to find and identify any reason why this may be hazardous. We need to alert our TSDF of any hazards that may apply. So we keep going. Next is copper, 450 parts per million. But if we compare that to our regulations, we'll find that copper isn't on the list. It's not regulated by hazardous waste. So therefore, it's not meaningful to any of our rules or regulations. 
Next is lead. Lead was found at 46 parts per million. The regulated standard for lead, 5 parts per million. So once again, we have something that's well above the regulatory limit. We have to add another waste code, in this instance, D008, to tell everyone that it's hazardous because of its lead content as well. Continuing on, mercury is BDL. The lab can see well below our regulated limit again. Selenium is at 0 0.01. That's much less than the regulated limit for selenium. Silver is regulated at 5, and we have 1. So that, once again, is below the regulation limit. Zinc, at 67 parts per million, is another constituent that is not regulated by hazardous waste rules. So, not relevant for our concerns. But after going through our questions of, is it a listed waste? Is it a hazardous characteristic waste? We found that there were two reasons why it's regulated. It has too much chromium and it has too much lead. And we've assigned two waste codes to this particular waste so that everyone at the TSDF and points in between us and them can identify it as hazardous and why. Now our last question, the fifth step, is this a hazardous waste mixture? We said it's a blend of water, coolant, and stainless steel. So it's a mixture, but is it a hazardous waste mixture? Well, did we create a hazardous waste and then mix it with something else? No, we didn't. So even though it's a mixture, it's not what we call a hazardous waste mixture. Remember, the best reason you can have for remembering that fifth step is as a reminder that if you spill something and clean it up with another material, it can still carry the same waste code. In our scenario, that's not what happened. So that's how we walk through the waste determination process. It's a lot to know. It is probably the most complex of all of the hazardous waste rules, but I hope it's helpful in getting you to take the first step or second or third toward doing a better determination for your site.